Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp and I welcome you to the second in the Science for the Public Health and Environment uh, lecture series at Cambridge Public Library. Tonight, it's our great pleasure to introduce Charles Langmuir, Higgins Professor of Geochemistry at Harvard University. Dr. Langmuir will describe the interdependent relationship between our planet and the evolution of life and the importance of that relationship. Charles Langmuir received his BA from Harvard University and his PhD from State University of New York at Stony Brook. He joined the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard in 2002 after a service of 20 years at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. <clears throat> Professor Langmuir is a distinguished international authority on many aspects of the solid earth geochemical cycle. He's conducted 20 research cruises and he discovered hydrothermal sites at three ocean basins. After tonight, you'll know what all that means. He also co-led the first investigation of the Arctic Ocean Ridge System. Dr. Langmuir is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Geochemical Society, and the American Geophysical Union, from which he received the N.L. Bowen Award in 1996. He also received the Holmes Medal of the European Union of Geosciences in 2003. Dr. Langmuir is co-author with Wally Broker of a major book and textbook also, How to Build a Habitable Planet. And here it is. And he wrote the latest edition, actually. I should point out that although it looks like a textbook and it is used as a textbook and it is a substantial amount of book, it is very accessible and very informative. If you read pieces of this, you'll want this on your bookshelf, for sure. Um, it's very informative and it is unique uh, because it takes up the evolution of the universe and the evolution of life and puts all of this together so that you will understand this kind of a system, how all of these things go together and as he says, how life is a planetary phenomenon. So it that's a very special thing about it. As far as I know, it's the only book that does that, begins with the beginning of the universe and goes all the way to life. And particularly this planet and how it supports life and how life impacts the planet. And this talk will make us aware, I think, of the extraordinary privilege of life and our subsequent responsibility to take care of this planet. It is a very great honor to welcome Dr. Charles Langmuir. I'm sorry, just one second. I forgot to mention that the, um, the Quarter Square Books has the books outside the door here, and you can get a book and have it signed afterward tonight. I'm so sorry. Please Thank you. Me. Good evening. It's very nice to be with you tonight. So what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is the ultimately the relationship between human beings like all of us in the room and this wonderful planet on which we live. And of course, all of us um, are aware almost every day in the newspaper of issues like global warming and uh, how we may be impacting the planet. But very few of us have the realization of the place of human beings in planetary evolution writ large. That is, not just what's been happening over the last few decades as our emissions of CO2 have become very great, but really what might be the place of a human being in the evolution of our planet over four and a half billion years. And what I'll want to share with you is the remarkable event from a planetary point of view 
that the arising of intelligent life with technological civilization is. And it raises real questions about both planetary evolution and about the role of us as human beings in the possible development of our planet. And this is a, a very different perspective than uh, the map that you see on the screen. Uh, usually when we talk about the world, uh, we, we think of the world as looking at something like this. And of course, this is not the world at all. These are national boundaries and we don't have the incredible beauty of the oceans and the ocean floor. We don't see the atmosphere. We don't see any of the geological characteristics. And if you look at maps like this, um, go to Encyclopedia Britannica or something like that and see how all these country boundaries change um, over the years, it's actually quite remarkable to see them morph. Uh, so this perspective is a highly limited one. We are planetary citizens. We are citizens of the globe. We are not national citizens of individual countries. So there are four take-home perspectives that I'd like you to leave the room with. Uh, the first one is scales of time and space, which are something I think it's almost impossible for us to really fathom. The second one is a view of the evolution of the planet over Earth history as, a seri as an evolution of increasing relationship among the planetary parts. The third is to consider planetary evolution as a series of energy revolutions which entail a complete change in the way the planet functions. We think the planet has always been the way it is today, but if we went back a few hundred million years, very small portion of planetary history, there'd be no animals we recognize and nothing for us to eat. So planets change a lot over short periods of time. And then when you look at the Earth from these kinds of perspectives, what, does that, what difference does that make in terms of how we view ourselves as human beings and human civilization? So we're going to go through a quick universal history. Um, the Big Bang occurred about 14 billion years ago. It's represented on the left-hand side of this figure. So, over most of the history of the universe, what was happening was the formation of the elements. That at the time of the Big Bang, only hydrogen and helium were formed, and it takes many billions of years for stars to become used there. Stars are element factories, and the stars form the elements, and some of them explode into massive, big explosions called supernovas, like the one when Christ was born, which was a supernova appearing in the sky. And that event is just the scattering of the elements throughout the galaxy so that they're available when uh, about 10 billion years after the formation of the universe, our, so our sun and solar system form. And since there's things like iron and silicon and sodium and magnesium and aluminum and all the elements that we, and carbon, the things that make us up and make the planet up, those elements have been formed earlier in the history of the universe and are available for the formation of our solar system 4.56 billion years ago. <clears throat> now, in this overall process of the evolution of the universe, galaxies form. And this is a view taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of one small portion of the sky looking at the deep at the deep ends of the universe. And each one of these blobs in here is a galaxy. So by taking an image like this and knowing what fraction of the sky it represents, you can then extrapolate and figure out how many galaxies there are in the universe. And it's something like 400 billion of them. So for every human being on Earth, there's a few hundred galaxies out there. Now. Our galaxy is only one of those 400 billion, and of course this is a, not the Milky Way, but is another galaxy which we're pretending that we would look at as if we could get out of our own galaxy and take a look at it. And our star is one of the stars in the sort of outer suburbs of this galaxy, our Milky Way. And each galaxy has about 400 billion stars. So there's 400 billion galaxies, each one with 400 billion stars, and our star is just a kind of an ordinary star in one of those galaxies, and it looks like this. 
It does dramatic things like send out solar flares. And around our star, there were a series of planets formed. And of course, one of them is the topic of our discussion tonight, the planet Earth. And here is Earth to scale with respect to the sun. That little black dot right there. That little black dot relative to this one perfectly ordinary star, one of 400 billion stars in our galaxy, and there are 400 billion galaxies in the universe. So, for every person on Earth, there are trillions of stars in the universe. This kind of, next time you wake up in the morning and you feel important, you can consider that kind of a fact. So we're going to be talking about this planet, and, and the remarkable thing about it is that over uh, four and a half billion years of planetary evolution, there arose the possibility of beings like ourselves to come along with our little brains packed inside our little heads. And with those brains, we are able to um, investigate, question, and understand the facts of this amazing universe of which we are a part, despite the fact that we are, as individuals, so incredibly insignificant. Well, in the beginning, when the sun formed, there was a lot of debris in the solar system. And that debris came down and rained down on large objects and created the various planets that went around the sun. That's still happening slowly. When you look up in the night sky and you see a meteor shower or you see a comet, these are potential new impacts for the Earth or other planets. And gradually over time, we accrete more and more material and Earth gradually gets bigger and bigger, albeit now at a very slow rate. <clears throat> now, after this very traumatic beginning of the Earth, where it was being pounded by incoming meteorites all the time, if there had been any life around, it would have been sterilized continually by all these incoming impacts. The Earth settled down, it formed a crust, it began to have volcanoes on it, the impacts were much less frequent. And after just a couple of hundred million years, I know that seems like a long time, but in Earth history it's not so long, once there was a liquid ocean, and that word is supposed to say continents, um, it's possible to form a stable climate. And I won't go into the mechanisms by which stable climate is maintained on the Earth, but one of the important mechanisms is carbon dioxide, that we must have carbon dioxide in our atmosphere in order for the climate to be stable. And in fact, climate, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been a kind of a regulator that has kept the planet stable enough to have liquid water throughout its history. So we say, oh, CO2 in the atmosphere is bad. CO2 in the atmosphere is essential. It's just the rapid rate of change that we're injecting CO2 into the atmosphere that is problematic. This stable climate with a liquid ocean and um, life that would, and a climate that would be suitable for life occurs very early in Earth history, uh, after just a few percent of Earth history, about 4.4 billion years. Now, when we try to look back at the origin of life, that's uh, research in that area is based on the tree of life, where at the edges of the tree are all the extant animals that exist on the Earth today. And each one of them has a long history, going back thousands or hundreds of thousands of generations, back to primitive organisms that existed far back in Earth history. So we think there was an origin of life. Primitive life evolved. It generated this branch first. This is a group of bacteria called the a group of microorganisms called archaea. And then it also generated another group of microorganisms called bacteria. Um, the bacteria are in us and around us everywhere. There are about 10 million of them on every square centimeter of your skin. If they had a vote, there'd be enough bacteria in each one of us to completely dominate the democratic process. We just don't let them vote. <laughs> and later on, there was more complex life forms of what we call eukaryotic cells. This is multicellular life. And one little branch of that is the animals. So that's you and me and mice, ducks, lizards, and everything on this little branch extending out of the tree of life. 
So you can see that most of life, in terms of numbers, in terms of genetic diversity, is down here. It's these unicellular organisms. Now, these are probably representatives of the earliest forms of life. And so we're going to look at these first and see what these primitive organisms look like. We don't really know what the first organism was like. We only have the present day representatives of them. But as you look at the way the tree of life is structured, these are more representative of early life than anything that we have up here. And what we're going to look at is the evolution of life in this, on this basis. And if there's a first take home message, it's evolution as a, progress, as a matter of progressively increasing relationships among the various parts. So the most primitive cells and those that existed for most of Earth history um, are these unicellular organisms called prokaryotes. Uh, this, of course, is a greatly exaggerated picture of one. And it doesn't have a, a nucleus inside the cell, just has a little bit of tiny bit of DNA, and it's got a cell wall in which a lot of its cellular processes take place. They're really tiny, one micron, so small you can't even see them with many normal microscopes. And they live a very short period of time. They can divide every 20 minutes. And this word anaerobic means they don't use oxygen. So they can live their life cycle in places where there's no oxygen present. They divide every 20 minutes. So let's go through 10 generations. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,000. So one cell becomes 1,000 in 10 generations, 200 minutes, that's three hours. Three hours later, the 1,000 cells have become a million cells. Three hours later, the million cells have become a billion cells. And this is why these little babies can make us sick very, very fast. Because in just a half a day, one of them can turn into a billion of them. And so they can have a big effect on our bodies. That also means that uh, you know, all of human civilization is a few thousand generations, going back to the first arising of beings like ourselves. And you can go through a thousand generations of these guys in a few days. So you can do experiments on the laboratory, do all kinds of things. They can have great histories of great population growth and population destruction. They can go through evolutionary change. All of this can be investigated in a test tube because of these little tiny short lifetimes that they have. This is what life was on Earth for almost all of Earth history. And so if you go back and look at life on the Earth in the old days, you would not see anything you recognize. If you went to a place where life was abundant, you would find bacterial slime. That's all there was on the surface. <clears throat> now these guys also developed partnerships. And so they had developed ecosystems where one would become dependent on another for various processes. And ultimately, these partnerships led to the arising of permanent partnerships. These are the eukaryotic cells. Those are the ones we're most used to looking at. That's what a brain cell looks like, or a muscle cell, or a bone cell. And they have a cellular nucleus. They're much bigger, so this is the size of the one cell I was showing you before. These guys are 10 times bigger in diameter, so 1,000 times bigger in size. They're big. You can see them under a microscope pretty easily. They have 1,000 times more DNA. They divide in 24 hours instead of 20 minutes, and they're normally oxygen using. And so the development of these from these is a matter of long-term relationships. So these little organelles that are inside the eukaryotic cells are actually the vestiges of partnerships among these guys who all came together to form a kind of a cellular factory. These formed about 1.7 billion years ago. And as you can imagine, they live together, they develop relationships, they compete with one another, they become dependent on one another, and ultimately they realize the advantages of relationship. So they form relationships to make multicellular organisms, like this one, which is an old fossil called a trilobite. And so we are a partnership among about a trillion eukaryotic cells of 270 different types, all working together. And we call ourselves I, 
and give ourselves names and so on, but in fact we're just this huge partnership of all these cells working together. These organisms started out very simple and they gradually evolved to greater and greater complexity and so you, after a few hundred million years, you developed more and more and larger organisms. This is a cartoon of a Devonian landscape about 300 million years ago and there you began to see things like fish and ultimately you got things like dinosaurs and then you got things like mammals and ultimately you came with the very complex and diverse uh, life that we have on Earth today. So life has evolved over billions of years as increasing relationship, increasing partnership. So we got our first point, scale. The second point, increasing relationship. And the third one is planetary evolution as transformation of energy. Now, I'm going to be using the words reduced and oxidized and that just has a matter of how many electrons go around an atom. A reduced atom has a lot of electrons going around it and an oxidized electron has very few. <clears throat> when you have all reduced atoms, then not very much chemistry is possible the way we think of it. So what you need to do in order to be able to re release a lot of energy is to create a reduced atom that's like wood or sugar and an oxidized atom that's like an oxygen molecule and when those two come together you have one that has too many electrons and one that doesn't have enough electrons and they come together and big explosion happens energy is produced so we use that all the time um, if we we don't anymore but if we light a cigarette and we use our cigarette lighter kabam we're taking a reduced molecule gas or propane or whatever in the lighter, kerosene, and we have the oxygen in the atmosphere and kabam, they come together and produce instant energy. As we all sit here, um, probably most of you, if you weren't fasting, had some food earlier today. The food is a reduced molecule, so it goes into your body. And as you breathe, you're combining that food with the oxygen in the atmosphere and the combination of the food with the oxygen produces all the energy in our bodies that makes us work. And so our body runs like an electric current and it's a hundred watts. So look at a hundred watt light bulb, that's what we are, we're a hundred watt machine. That's why it's nice to get in bed with your partner at night or to cuddle with a dog because they're each generating about 100 watts of power and so there's a lot of warmth coming out of them because of this electric current that is taking place because of the mixing of the food with the oxygen in the atmosphere. We are kind of fuel cells. You hear about fuel cells with cars. Well, that's going to be taking a reduced molecule, hydrogen, having it combined with oxygen, producing the power that runs a car. And that's what we can do just by breathing and eating. And we can do that because there are, have been formed over Earth history these reduced molecules and oxidized molecules that in combination allow us to produce energy. So planets start out without this possibility because there's no free oxygen. So you put you in a room with no oxygen, you put a candle over, a beaker over a candle, and the candle goes out very quickly because it uses up the oxygen, there's no oxygen left. So no oxygen, we can't live, we can't, we don't have the energy accessible to us. And early Earth was like that. You go back there, there's nothing to breathe. This turns out to be a good thing because the origin of life requires reduced molecules. Um, all the molecules that make us up are reduced molecules and so you need to be able to make those non-biologically originally. And so all these precursor molecules that are necessary for life to form need to be this reduced kind of molecule. Now what life does is it increases energy flow. Actually, I'm just, I'm going to skip that. So life is, a, is an electric current and there's really two aspects to it. There's plant life and that makes reduced molecules and an oxidized complement. So you take carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and you have to find some source of electrons. And when you add the electrons to the carbon dioxide, it makes this molecule, which is sugar, plus some oxidized byproduct. 
And the carbon goes from having a deficit of electrons in this form to having just the right amount of electrons in this form. So there's been an electron transfer. That's like an electric current. So over Earth history, what's happened is that life has taken carbon dioxide. It's looked around for things to donate electrons to it. It's produced organic molecules like sugar and an oxidized byproduct like oxygen. And those two, when they're recombined, can generate more energy. So over Earth history, life has produced these two reservoirs, the reduced one and the oxidized one. And we need that for advanced life. So in a car or in any kind of fuel cell, you have a reduced molecule, hydrogen. You take the oxygen from the atmosphere. Those two want to combine together to make water. And you control that combination so that the electrons go through a wire. And that makes an electric current. And that lights a light bulb. And the Earth, modern Earth, is like that. We have reduced species coming from the Earth or being made by life. And they're able to combine with oxygen in the atmosphere. And that produces the electric current that powers life like us. We can't exist until this chemical potential is produced by Earth. And that takes billions of years of planetary evolution. So we've got reduced species, organic carbon like buried coal and oil, and reduced molecules that are in Earth's interior. And we have our oxidized exterior. And when those two things combine, then we get energy. So how did this happen? Uh, now we have instant energy available to us. At the beginning of Earth, we didn't. And it happened in a series of transformations that I'm going to call energy revolutions. So earliest life probably has to start just by making use of chemicals that are just there on the Earth. And that's a tough life because they have to be looking around and just sitting there. They didn't have any mobility. They have to sit and wait for the chemicals they need to come down and be able to feed them. So the first energy revolution is when life discovers the possibility of making its own food. That's what plants do. They take the energy from the sun, and they are able to use the carbon dioxide and water and the other things that are there in the oil, in the soil. And they combine them together to make the sugar that they need to power their whole metabolism. Now, when that first started, they were using sunlight, probably. Um, but they needed to take the carbon dioxide that was present, the solar energy, and they needed to find a source of electrons. And they looked for things like hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide. OK, those seem like arcane molecules to you. Well, that's right. There's not very much of them around. So life is really limited because it depends on finding these guys in, able, in order to be able to make their food. So after about a billion years, they discovered a better way to do business. And that would be to make your own food, not from rare molecules like hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide, but from common molecules. So what photosynthesis does, it's a miraculous complex process that life took billions of years to discover. It takes carbon dioxide, which is a common molecule, and water, which is common. And it uses those combined with solar energy to make its sugar. And it produces oxygen as a byproduct. So it's no longer limited by things like hydrogen not being around. And this gives it much greater access to solar energy. And that means that this kind of life took over the world and is still taking over the world. Mm -hmm. That means that you're no longer limited by these guys. You're limited by things like potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus, the things that are in the fertilizer that we buy. There's plenty of CO2 and water around. And because there's so much of those around, these are limited not by these critical reagents, unless you live in a desert, but by the other minor elements of life. Now, this then is a great is great because life can really expand, but it's not a free lunch because in addition to making sugar, for every sugar molecule you make, you make an oxygen molecule. You think, oxygen, that's great. But we all know that we're supposed to eat our broccoli and our spinach. Why? They're antioxidants, right? 
And if we stop having the antioxidants in our body and our body stops metabolizing, what happens? We just decay. So the oxygen, if you put us into a fire, we burn. So the oxygen in the atmosphere is constantly wanting to combine with our molecules and destroy them. So the only way we're able to survive that process and not just be destroyed by oxygen and turn back into carbon dioxide and water is because we've developed protective mechanisms. So this oxygen that is initially produced is a terrible poison for life. They didn't have oxygen protection. They didn't have the antioxidants. And it took them a long time to develop that protection. Once they developed it, then they discovered that oxygen was actually had a bright side. And that is that previously when you metabolized a sugar molecule and you produced these byproducts, you produced two energy units. It says a complex name, adenosine triphosphate. But you can just think of it as the energy that we need to metabolize and run our bodies. Burn a sugar, only get two energy units. But if you burn the sugar with oxygen, you get 36 energy units, 18 times more. So once you develop oxygen protection, then you have the opportunity of coexisting with the oxygen, and you coexist with the oxygen, and suddenly you've got 18 times as much energy as these poor guys who are not living in the presence of oxygen in the ability to use it, and so you take over the world because you have 18 times more power than these guys have. And this is the eukaryotic cells. So the eukaryotic cells, these big partnerships, they use this process, and that's why the anaerobic life, the one that doesn't use oxygen, is relocated to the interstices of ecosystems. These guys dominate it. So, all this requires transformation of the planetary surface because when you're producing the oxygen, it gets used up. It rusts the rocks. It burns the organic carbon. It combines with all the carbon that's around to produce CO2 and water again. And it's only after you saturate the whole surface with oxygen that free oxygen can build up in the atmosphere and be available to breathe. So only 2% of the oxygen resides as oxygen in the atmosphere. Most of it has been used to oxidize things like iron and sulfur in the earth and in the rocks. And we can see when this happened in earth history by looking at these two elements and looking at their history. So, I apologize for these chemical reactions, but this is what's happening when you breathe. You're combining the oxygen with sugar, and then you're breathing out CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's using up the oxygen in the atmosphere. Other ways oxygen are consumed are taking iron and rusting it, or taking sulfur and converting it to sulfur dioxide or sulfate. All of these things have oxygen on the left-hand side, and the oxygen combined with other things on the right-hand side. These are oxygen sinks using up all the oxygen that's formed. And the Earth has lots of this stuff in it. So it's only after you've, tight, you've uh, taken all these molecules and reacted them with the oxygen that you have excess oxygen left over that can rise up in the atmosphere. So we're going to look at when and how all this happened. And there are arcane geochemical tools for making those measurements, which I won't go into in detail. But this is a measurement of an aspect of the element sulfur. And that aspect was highly variable prior to 2.3 billion years ago, and then became completely constant after 2.3 billion years. Experiments have shown that this kind of behavior happens in the absence of any oxygen at all. And this kind of behavior happens after there's about 1% oxygen in the atmosphere. So this gives us a milestone uh, where we know that before 2.3 billion older, there was less than 1% oxygen, and after, there was more. <clears throat> There's another very nice aspect of these two elements, which is uh, their behavior in water, that sulfur, when it's combined with oxygen, forms a molecule that is easily dissolved in water. So sulfate the oxidized form of sulfur, is the most common element in seawater, most common anion after chlorine. Iron, on the other hand, is really insoluble in when it's in its oxidized form and relatively soluble in its reduced form. 
So the sulfur to iron ratio in today's oxidized ocean is about 10 trillion. Really high. Have you all heard about this experiment of throwing iron into the ocean to try to solve the CO2 problem? Well, oh, there's only a few parts per trillion iron in the ocean. And all the organisms in the ocean are just dying to photosynthesize. But they need iron in their bodies. And there's no iron in the ocean. So they're just sitting there waiting for an iron molecule to come around so that they can metabolize and grow and create lots of babies. So the idea was all right. When that happens, they take CO2 out of the atmosphere because they make more life. So what we'll do is we'll just fertilize the ocean with iron. So this experiment was done. Ship went out, dumped a lot of iron into the ocean. The microorganisms went crazy. And they formed a huge biomass as a result of the iron sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. It was great. Meanwhile, there's shrimp in the ocean. And the shrimp are always going around looking for food. So they're looking for the microorganisms. They're animals like us. So they eat things and produce CO2. So the shrimp can't believe their luck in this iron fertilization domain because suddenly there's tons of food for them. So they eat the food. They have lots of babies. They create more shrimp and more shrimp. And by eating all the food, they send the CO2 back up into the atmosphere. So what all that did was create a very dynamic community where you had lots of bacteria drawing down the CO2 and lots of shrimp sending the CO2 right back up into the atmosphere. Net effect is no benefit except for the very exciting times for the bacteria and the shrimp. That's because iron is very low in today's ocean. That's because it's very insoluble when it's in its oxidized form. So early in Earth history, you had a situation where iron was soluble in the ocean. That's probably why life evolved to need iron, because it was abundant. Sulfur, when it's in its reduced form, it was insoluble. And so there was a time in Earth history where all the iron that was in the ocean precipitated out as the ocean became oxidized. And that forms these rocks, which occur only in a certain period of Earth history, and are the primary source of iron ore for modern civilization. So you have thousands of meters of this rock made up of about 60% iron, a really rich ore deposit, which formed when oxygen rose high enough that the iron that was in the ocean just precipitated out to form these sediments. <clears throat> And this happens about the same time as this magic time when the sulfur shows that oxygen changed, that you were gradually adding oxygen to the ocean, you were precipitating out these sediments, and then after the oxygen rises to a certain level, all the iron is precipitated out, except for this one little event here that we don't understand very well. And that, at that point, this, these iron-rich rocks no longer formed in all of Earth's history. So there's a lot of other evidence that you can go forward and try to figure out how oxygen may have changed through time. It started out at zero, and maybe it went up in steps, maybe it went up continually, but ultimately it gradually gets up to about 21%, which it is today. And when it reaches that level, then there's a critical mass of oxygen in the atmosphere that things can breathe. And once you have that possibility, then you have your fourth energy revolution, which is developing multicellular life. And then you can have the eukaryotic cells become specialized. You can have active transport of oxidized and reduced species to take advantage of this energy transformation. And so that's what we do. We breathe in, actively transporting the oxygen into our bodies. We take the food, we chew it, we bust it up, we transport it to our lungs via the bloodstream, and we allow that chemical transformation to take place. We are these wonderful energy transforming apparatuses. <clears throat> So each of these four revolutions in energy corresponds to a big change in Earth history, where the whole nature of life changes. Once you get eukaryotic cells, the first primitive organisms just had a few cells. Now you have human beings with a few hundred cells and all working together. This is this evolving partnership over the last 500 million years, gradually creating more and more complex life of greater and greater uh, complexity and diversity. 
This all happens only over the last 15% of all of Earth history. Coal and oil are made by multicellular life, so they just start to be formed here. The first fossils are down here. Almost 90% of all of Earth's life is just the bacterial slime stage, where Earth is just becoming transformed, ready for multicellular life to pr proceed. <clears throat> so life is planetary. It's not like we sit on top of the planet and make use of it. Life and the planet co-evolve together. Uh, life evolves in relationship with the planet and it progressively modifies the planet to this form, this single integrated ecosystem that actually is not just life, it's the relationship of life with the planet itself. And over this period we see long periods of time where nothing seems to change. This must be supported by some kind of stable feedbacks. And then this becomes perturbed when the planet moves to the next level of complexity and ability to transform energy. And evolution is proceeding over this process by increasing access to energy and increasing relationship. So my colleague at Harvard, Andy Noel, um, and his colleague uh, Bombach, pr propose that you can sort of divide planetary history into this kind of evolution trajectory where you have the first primitive cells, then they diversify and occupy all the available ecological niches and then they develop their partnerships and you get these eukaryotic cells and then the eukaryotic cells start working together and they produce multicellular organisms and then these organisms which are originally in the oceans are able to breathe the air and invade the land and then you get mammals and very recently you get creatures like us. Many planets don't make it through all these stages. For example, when you look at Mars we see the Martian planet with no life, no plate tectonics, no active systems, not a stable climate. But maybe early in Martian history, it reached one of these primitive areas, one of these developments. And then it just didn't have the planetary, um, it just didn't have the necessary planetary characteristics to evolve to subsequent stages of planetary evolution. We can imagine planets throughout the universe evolving to the ver these various stages and not being able to get any farther. They don't pass the oxygen revolution. They don't enable, they don't have the geological conditions to have a stable climate. So they get to a certain stage and then boom, life is over. All right, so how do human beings fit into this overall story? So let's look at human civilization from this perspective that we've just talked about, about planetary evolution as increasing relationship, increasing access to energy. Now I mentioned that we all use 100 watts, that's what dogs and cats use, and 100 watts of energy, this is watts, this is energy usage on the vertical axis, and this is 100 watts down here, this is 2000, so 100 is very close to this zero down here. And that's what we get to use by eating food. <clears throat> that puts us on an equal footing with lions and tigers and wolves and antelope and everything else. All of us eat food and generate about 100 watts. Now you as human beings in the United States use about 10,000 watts. 100 times more energy. You used it when you got here today. You use it when you wear the clothes you wear. You use it when you buy strawberries from Peru or Mexico. All of the, you use it when you're able to get food in the wintertime. You use it when you're heating your homes, when you drive your cars, when you turn on light bulbs. 10,000 watts, 100 times your animal budget of energy. And you can see that other nations on Earth use much less. The global average is 2,300 watts. So as Americans, we use four times the global average. So it's a really interesting question to say, well, everybody, especially in Cambridge, wants to be fair. So your fair allotment of energy is 2,300 watts. So you need to cut your energy usage by 75% in order to have your global allotment. If you do that, your lifestyle goes to pot, okay? Extremely difficult. And yet there are many nations, poor ones, like Africa and India and portions of Latin America, that are surviving on much less than their allotment of energy. And that's why places like China and India want to increase their energy usage because it increases their standard of living. 
Now this is, an, this is a human energy revolution. This is the average global citizen being able to use 23 times as much energy as any other animal. Americans, 100 times as much energy as any other animal. It makes us supermen, literally. We can leap tall buildings. We can fly through the air. We can punch through walls. We do all these things with the tools that we can use as thanks to the energy that we're using. So this is why humans have been able to take over the world because we're able to use 100 times more energy than anybody else. And it's the reason why Europe and the United States are powerful countries and Africa and India are not powerful countries because we use 10 times as much energy per person as they do. And that gives us a huge advantage in all areas of endeavor. Now this has been possible through fossil fuels. So here's the, this black box shows the growth of fossil fuels over Earth history. Starting about 450 million years ago, the index, the resources of fossil fuels gradually build up over the Earth. And then human beings arrive and in a few hundred years, maybe peak oil won't happen this decade, but give it a hundred years, we're using up all the fossil fuels in a few hundred years of all of Earth history. 450 million years of accumulation, a few hundred years of use. We live in the fossil fuel age, a unique couple of centuries in Earth history. So here I've blown up this scale. This is the amount of fossils being, fossil fuels being used starting 10,000 years ago. You have the Egyptians, you have Christ, you have Mohammed, steam engine, kabam, fossil fuels are used and over a couple hundred years they're going to be all gone. So human beings arrived on Earth to find a stocked treasure chest of a planet. There were the banded iron formations formed three billion years ago that provided us all, all the iron we need. There were the phosphate deposits that provide us with all the fertilizer we need. There's all the fossil fuel deposits that provide us with all the energy we need. And we arrived finding this treasure chest of stuff there for our use. And we said, oh boy, how great. And so we got to use it all up in just a couple of hundred years. Now, thanks to this, we've also developed a relationship revolution. So for one thing, we have language. So we can communicate with one another, and no other animal species can do that. We have the possibility of global sensing from all the satellites and from instruments that can be deployed all over the planet. We have global communication. I, it's nice none of you were checking your cell phones during this talk, but if you wanted to, you could be communicating with anyone around the world in any country. It's an amazing phenomenon. We have this ability to relate to scales much larger than ourselves, like planets and galaxies and universes, and much smaller than ourselves, like cells and microorganisms. So this gives us a capacity of relationship to a whole range of scales, which is absent from any other organism. And we have, through biotech, the ability to undertake directed evolution of other species. So we can now direct evolution. And we have a frontier of new capabilities from the coupling of biology and technology. Google Glass is one example. Eventually, it's going to be Google Glass in your brain. So you're going to have some chip in your brain, and you're going to be able to receive the signals. You're not going to have to remember anything. You can just Google it. <laughs> uh, what a horrible thought. And of course, associated with this are a host of environmental problems. So I'm not going to talk about global warming, which I'm sure you're all aware of. I think two more serious problems are water resources and biodiversity. And these are more troubling because the biodiversity determines the health of the ecosystems on which we depend, and the water resources are absolutely essential for our food supply. So this is an image taken by satellite showing groundwater depletion in India. This is one of the most extensively irrigated portions, on portions of the world, and it's also where a huge number of people live. And the groundwater is going down at about four centimeters per year eventually that groundwater resource is going to disappear. A lot of the groundwater resources that are present have to do with uh, water left over from the last ice age, which filled the aquifers. 
Uh, this resource is also replenished by snow falling in the Himalayas and when you with global warming you have less snow you have less replenishment of the groundwater <clears throat> for biodiversity whenever human beings appeared on a continent then the big animals that were present on the continent disappeared if you came to America 20,000 years ago you would have found these magnificent beasts living on it but as soon as human beings crossed the Bering Land Bridge and populated the populated North America, these guys very rapidly went extinct. And Ed Wilson at Harvard has shown how whenever you go to a particular land mass, as soon as the human beings arrive, the animals go extinct, especially all the big ones. We're taking getting rid of habitat, which is essential for many animals to live on. So this, you know, this is just looks like a bar graph. This is years from 1989 to 2004. This is the number of square kilometers of rainforest that are being cut down in each one of those years. To make that a little bit more graphic, here's Massachusetts, there's Cape Cod, New York. Uh, this is the area, all of Massachusetts, all of Connecticut, part of New Hampshire and Vermont. That's the area of rainforest that is cut down annually. It's phenomenal. And all of this is happening because of human population growth. So the environmental problem that nobody is willing to talk about is human population. So here is human population growth from um, 12,000 years ago. And this is the number of human beings. And this is a log scale. So a exponential growth is a straight line on this. And you can see there was exponential growth for several thousand years as human population on Earth increased from about one million people, less than the size of Boston on the whole planet, to about 10 million people. And gradually, at about the time of the Romans, there were about 200 million people. You had the Dark Ages, and there was no population growth at that time. Then you had the discovery of fossil fuels, and population growth went super exponential. So here is population growth since 1800, starting at less than a billion people up to about 7 billion people today. You think of this statistic. If you had a terrible thing happen on Earth so that 97% of everyone on Earth died, we would still have the same number of people as there were in the year 1600. So since 1600, 30 times more people. You say, of course, with 30 times more people, you have 30 times the environmental effect. And this population growth is the critical parameter for our influence on the planet. And this is the growth rate. So the growth rate for human beings for thousands of years was about 0.1% per year. That's doubling every 720 years. And now, we're up at a rate of 1 to 2 percent per year. That means we double in 36 years. You go from doubling in 1,000 years to doubling in 36 years. Makes a huge difference in terms of planetary impact. Now, the other thing is that you can imagine a politician coming along and saying, uh, OK, no sex, because we don't want population growth, and no economic growth because economic growth is really bad for the environment. You can imagine how well they would do in the polls, how well they would be discussed on the TV talk shows. And that's because the GDP per capita is an important indicator of the health and happiness of a particular country. So you take the United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, they're all the high GDP per person. That's how much money each person gets. We're the rich countries, we have a nice life. And you look down here at Africa and Asia, and absent China and Japan, and you see that their total amount of GDP is about 10 times less than ours. So 10 times poorer than we are. The reason for that is because of our energy use. So this is energy on this vertical axis, this is GDP on this axis, and you can see that energy use and GDP correlate very exactly with one another. Now, yes, there are more energy efficient countries like Europe and Japan and New Zealand, 
and their less energy efficient countries like the former Soviet Union, the Middle East, and Canada, what are the characteristics of those guys? No? They have lots of energy resources. Canada has a lot of oil, tar sands. Russia has all its gas that it's using as a political weapon these days. The Middle East has all its oil, which it used for the oil embargo back in the 1970s. These guys have tons of resources available to them, so they're relatively inefficient. Europe and Japan have no more fossil fuel resources, so they've generated much greater efficiencies. But while there are those small differences, nonetheless, this overall trend between GDP, how well off we are, and energy use is closely related. And energy use, because it depends on fossil fuels, is closely related to CO2 emissions. So here we have the total primary energy used and the total CO2 that's emitted. So if you want the good life, you need to use more energy. And if you want to use more energy, you emit more CO2. And if you want to win, and if you use more energy, you can have as many people as you want because you have access to food, you have access to housing, you have access to exploiting all the resources the Earth has to offer. Okay, so I know that sounds pretty bleak, but these are soluble problems, <clears throat> at least in principle. If, if, you, if we had the political will and were willing to make the political decisions, we could solve these environmental problems. We can reduce CO2 emissions, we can develop wind and solar power, we can make burning of fossil fuels very expensive, we can build great public transportation systems, we can set aside reserves, we can control population. Do all of these things sound like they would be impossible for us to do? No. We could do them if we had the political will to do them. So that's not really the issue. The issue is how to generate the political will, how to have a perspective that would make us willing to make these necessary choices. Now, this is all happening in the blink of an eye, in a blink of an eye from a planetary point of view. So this is just an indication of planetary history. Earth forms here. You get your, your stable climate forms here. Your first bacterial slime forms. You develop the partnerships. Eukaryotic cells form here, you get multicellular life forming here, mammals form here, and human beings form at the width of that line. So let's try to make this a little more graphic. <coughs> so if you look at it from a planetary point of view and we try to relate it to your lifetime, it would be as if human beings appeared last Friday in your life. And modern technology appears when this slide comes onto the screen. That's when we suddenly realize, oh, the Earth is an interconnected system. We are having consequences on our environment. It's just happened. So, kind of can think of it in, in this way, uh, that from the perspective of the planet, the arising of human beings have literally been like that. All of these changes are happening in the blink of an eye from a planetary point of view. And this blink of an eye is actually a new era in planetary history. We have this energy revolution. That's equivalent to the one that I talked about, about aerobic respiration. That changed the amount of energy available by a factor of 18. And those animals that had, those organisms that had access to that energy took over the world. We have the fossil fuel revolution. We took over the world. We have a mass extinction going on. The rate of animals being extinguished on Earth today is 10,000 times the natural background rate. We're having massive global environmental change often happens at these era boundaries. Consider what happened with the oxygen rising in the atmosphere, for example. We have a fundamental change in the way evolution can happen because we can manipulate DNA. And we have specialization within a species where none of us really knows how to do anything on our own. I mean, forgive me if there's, you know, great engineers out there, but most of us aren't able to build anything. We couldn't build a car, we can't build a computer, we don't even know how they work. And yet all these things function in our society because of the tremendous specialization that has occurred. That there are a few people who know how to do everything. 
and we have this vastly increased global connectivity and relationship from language to the internet. And these kinds of changes are larger changes than has ever occurred before in planetary history. So we are potentially at the beginning, not just of what people are calling the Anthropocene, that's one of these epic boundaries, that's a minor geological boundary. But we're at an era boundary where we're seeing a complete change in the potential for planetary functioning. So that means when we go back and look at this slide, <coughs> that the planet went through all these transformations. And right up here, we're at one of these vertical lines. We're at a place where the planet is going from one mode of operation to an entirely different operation, mode of operation. And the question is, will it then be able to survive that great change which is caused by human beings occurring on the planet? Or do we not acquire that next stage in planetary evolution and instead we die off and we go back to the stage where mammals exist on the Earth? That's fine. But the Earth doesn't have the potential that humans brings, human beings bring to it, which is a potential for planetary consciousness and intelligence. So, so the possibility of the future evolution of the planet is in our hands. Do we approach the planet from the point of view of what's in it for me? Look out for number one. Or we do, do we approach it from the point of view of, oh, I arrived from four and a half billions of planetary evolution. Every possibility that I have is actually a gift given to me by this planet's evolution over this incredibly long period of time in which suddenly I appear and the planet is here for me to relate to. Well, this relates to also to the question of life in the universe. And it relates to life in the universe because the, whether there are other beings out there we could communicate with is a series of probabilities. And this series of how many stars have life, how many, I mean, how many stars are there, how many of these stars have planetary systems, how many of them evolve life, how, how, how many of them evolve technological civilization? How long does the technological civilization last? And you can make these kind of guesses at what these fractions would be, and then you can find out what the number of planets would be in our galaxy with technological civilization that we could say hi to. Well, it turns out that the most critical term in this is the fraction of a planetary lifetime that has a technological civilization. So let's say um, you were depending on uh, finding someone else on Earth that you could exchange an email with. Now, it turns out that when you consider how long each of you live, you only live for a microsecond. So you appear for a microsecond and you disappear. And you have to have another person appearing in exactly that same microsecond in order for the two of you to be able to communicate. There's a hundred year period, but you're only present in a billionth of that time period. And therefore, there's never anybody else you can talk to because you don't live long enough to talk to them. So that's the way it is in the galaxy. If a civilization only lives for 10,000 years, of course, our technological civilization has been around for a hundred years, so that's a lot longer than we have. And if you say, there's a civilization that exists, exists for 10,000 years, well, the galaxy's 10 billion years old. So if it exists for 10,000 years, the likelihood of another civilization existing at the same time is essentially zero. So you go through the statistics, and there's less than one in the galaxy. We're unique. We're alone in the universe. So the only way there can be intelligent life out there is if they don't last for 10,000 years, they don't last for 100,000 years, they last for millions or tens of millions of years. Okay, so think about it. 100 years of technological advancement, the damage we do to the planet and the technological achievements. 
We don't know what the technological achievements are going to be 50 years from now. Imagine 100 years from now. Imagine 1,000 years from now. Imagine 100,000 years from now. We just arrived. And any other civilizations that are out there have been around for an immensely long period of time compared to the amount of time we've been there. And only if civilizations are able to last for that length of time are we not alone in the universe. So, we face an amazing challenge, a unique and wonderful challenge as human beings. And the question is whether we can pass from being a planetary user, what's in it for me, to a planetary conservator, what can I do to help? Can we become part of this wonderful natural system which has given birth to us, which would permit and perhaps even allow to participate in the further planetary evolution? You can imagine human beings as being kind of like a giant planetary brain, able to relate um, in a very positive way with the planetary body on which they coexist. Or you can think of it, uh, that's the, what can I do to help? How can I be related? Or you can think of human beings as a planetary cancer. What's in it for me? I'm going to make use of everything I can for my own benefit. I don't give a damn what happens to anything else. <laughs> we have that choice. Only to the extent that other planetary civilizations have met this challenge are they out there for us to communicate. And the challenge we face is that if we were able to meet this ourselves, then we could potentially become a member of this galactic community. God, it's such a grand ending, and then you see the misspelling. <laughs> what, to, what it means to be a human being. So we are an outgrowth of planetary evolution of this object. We are the potential next stage in the evolution of that project, of this planet, if we were able to relate to it in the proper way. So, are we a potential new organ of planetary consciousness and a potential agent for planetary evolution taking a planet to its next stage of evolution? Or are we a planetary destroyer? just sending a planet back to its previous stage of functioning. And am I such a human being in the way I relate to the planet and live my life? So the relationship between us and a planet, I hope I've conveyed to you the, um, the concept that a planetary perspective on this puts the place of human beings in the functioning of a planet on a different scale than one on which we just think of the problem in terms of what do we do about CO2 or how do we grow the economy. Or what. It's a much bigger question and problem than that that is faced with us for the challenge of us and our, and our children. Thank you.